Um, we are going to be discussing talent acquisition and, and where it is, where it's heading, and we have a great diverse panel here that's joined us. Um, you know, we always kind of describe it as candidate-driven or client-driven type market um, or, or, or where you get to choose the candidate. What, how would you classify it right now as it stands? Would you say it's either or? I feel that it's very candidate driven. I think that um, you know there are some great, great people in this industry, and I think that as these games come out and we're seeing these record numbers on these games, that the people that are associated with these games really get to kind of write their own ticket. Um, and so it's a challenge for me or us to connect with those people and, and really make them understand that we want to partner with them to make sure that we know what their next opportunity looks like and that we are going to deliver that to them. Yeah, I mean, I think it's the, that kind of ebb and flow is very indicative of just where the market is as a whole. Right? If the economy is good, it's going to be Canada is king because everyone's hiring. Um, and a downturn is obviously just going to be the studios that are at the top of that bubble um, that still have the money to continue to grow and, and produce new IPs. So that's when it becomes client is king. But right now and for the last couple of years and hopefully for the next couple of more years, depending on you know what economists you listen to, that will remain in the Canada's king market. So, I think, I think it also goes to show, well, if you think about the proactive side and how to hire the best possible people, I think it, it, it is always candidate driven, mm -hmm. but it's that long term relationship that I think that helps build companies towards success. So if you're just filling a seat to fill a problem or fill, a, well, try to find a solution to a problem, you're never going to find great long term talent. It's building the relationships from the beginning. So it's both candidate and client driven, I think. So you're just finding the best person for the company as a culture piece, I think is where you find the best. So I can't say if it's one or the other, because I think you're always trying to think five years ahead. And I mean, both you and Christina, I mean, Corey and I are obviously on the, you know, we've, we've done sort of the, the third party agency side, but you guys have come from an agency background. Is that what what drove you into this type of recruitment or did you see, would you have come to sort of this conclusion on your own anyway, being in cor on the sort of corporate side or, or how we phrase it, corporate side? I liked both. Yeah. Um, I think the, the relationships that you get to have when you're on the agency side is so awesome because you have these conversations with people and go, I got a, I got a company for you. You're, you have the perfect match for this culture. And at Electronic Arts, we have so many different cultures within many of our div divisions. So if I meet someone and I hear their passion and I introduce them to one of our executives, and it, it may take a little bit longer, but that culture will come. Mm -hmm. So it's more of the long game than the short game, because when you're working in an agency, it's typically on commission. And I like to be a part of the long game. So to, to see the people that you place and you're successfully partnering with them for the future is, is pretty empowering. So that's kind of what, what drove me into it, is I wanted to, to stay with the people that I placed instead of getting the phone call four years later going, OK, I need to find another role. <laughs> and you'd be like, oh, I feel so guilty. <laughs> that was what drove me to the, the company side. I think it was a little different for me. I, um, I really liked um, being on the agency side because you get to work for so many different clients and so many different cultures and, and represent those things. And it's uh, like a matchmaker kind of uh, job. And going to one company, um, EA is just a little bit bigger than Scopely, a little bit, yeah. Um, and so <laughs> with that being said, um, the long game is absolutely 1,000% accurate for me, um, as well as Christine, because of the fact that you know those opportunities might not be as abundant at Scopely just yet, um, and so you know it's great to partner with our our executive team and understand what the future looks like for our company, and then go out and talk to people and figure out what they want to do, and then just keep that in that mental register that we have going to continuously have these conversations about when is the right time that we align. So David, I know that you're you know, listening to us sort of on the talent acquisition side, obviously. I know that you're running, you said, your, your own game studio, 12-man 12, 12 team. How would you like describe your recruiting style right now, knowing kind of the way we're phrasing it as a proactive recruitment is, is sort of our methodology. How would you say you've found your success? Uh. I, you know, I, we, I can't decide if we're lucky or if this is, 
or, uh, or if this is just really normal. I haven't talked to other studios about it, but we, not coincidentally, a lot of people who work in games also like to play games, right? Um, and in fact, they're oftentimes super fans. So, so the very same things that we do to, um, to build our, our community of fans, like our mail list and our forums and things like that, are actually also essentially a, a source of talent acquisition, right? Because not surprisingly, probably four out of every five people we interview are like, oh, I love Alpha Bear, or I love Triple Town, or I love Realm of the Mad God, or one of the games we made, and, and may even have been you know, one of the more active users in those communities. And, um, and so, so they're following us on Twitter, right? They're, they're subscribed to our mail list, they're, doing, you know, they're following us on Facebook, whatever. Um, and so um, for the most part, when we wanted to find someone, it has literally been as simple as we tweet it, we post it on Facebook, um, and if we're really desperate, maybe we push a little harder than that, but it's usually not even necessary. Like, just those two things, and we'll get, whatever, 20 resumes. Um, you know, and of those, you know, two or three of them will actually be pretty good, you know, rep, you know and, and, and that's that. So, so a lot of it for us really literally just comes down to, you know, do a really good job of, of managing your community, which you want to do anyway as a studio, right? Like, it's like this essentially a no-brainer, um, and you will get this, this, this incredible free benefit. Um, and then on top of that, the, the one additional thing that we do, um, but again, we don't even do it, we didn't do it primarily for, for talent acquisition reasons. We did it because we wanted to get back to the indie community. So we, we make a point of going and speaking at, like this, like I'm, you know, I'm speaking here. Uh, I give a lecture at GDC almost every year. My business partner, Daniel, gives a lecture at GDC almost every year. And, and, and we are really open, like way more, I mean, particularly as compared to many of the, the studios that we'll talk at an event like this. Like we'll, we'll share everything, like here's our numbers, here's our retention, here's our, our poo, like whatever, we don't care. Here's how we did this. Here's Here's where we screwed up, and we're really, really open. And 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 one of the consequences is that I, I think uh, I'd like to believe our lectures tend to stand out, like they get a lot of attention. Um, and that's another good thing because people who might want to work for us end up watching those lectures, right? So I, I I regularly not it's not at the four or five ratio that that I was mentioning previously, but probably at least one in every third candidate will be like, oh yeah, and like when I'm interviewing them, like and I watched your three lectures recently and this and that and they they can they already know a bunch about how we do things in our company because they've been learning about it, you know, through the GDC ball, through the Casual Connect, you know, videos and stuff. Um, so those two things together, the, the combination of kind of like, hey, they're just fans anyway, and they they have been consuming our 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 for lack of a word, our, our industry content. Um, has made it um, has just made it really easy to reach a, a pretty decent audience, and like so that that's our approach. So we've never had to modify. We've never had to really worry. Um, the worst, the, the, probably the biggest stress comes from the fact that we we would like to be more diverse. We're, we're currently twelve guys, which I don't like at all. That's like not that's not diverse. it's it's not good. <laughs> it's not a diverse at all, right? Um, you know, white and Asian. That's it. Like white twelve white and Asian dudes. Um, and um, and I personally believe, and as does almost everyone in, in the company, that, that that's not that's that's not healthy. Like we've been very successful despite that. Um, I I think we would be more successful, and even if we weren't more successful, I think we'd just be better um, if we if we were more diverse. If we had women, if we had uh, other minorities. So um, um, so that's where our approach has fallen down. Our approach has not resulted in lots of resumes from women coming in, for example, particularly for like engineering positions where that we get to, we just get depressed. We'll get like again 20 ex resumes, maybe half of them are decent, maybe a fourth of them are you know look amazing and one of them will be from a woman, you know. And if for whatever the reason she doesn't fit culturally or otherwise like oh, that sucks, you know. So I think um, We've been talking a lot about that, and we don't frankly have very good answers aside from thinking we need to start signaling a lot more clearly. Like as before, we would we would do things like we would post looking for engineer, five years experience, whatever, right? And now we'll tweet, we'll be like, would especially love to see resumes from women, right? As an example, right? Or transgender or whatever, right? Um, and um, and we're hoping that that will help. I, I can't actually say that there's enormous amounts of evidence that it has helped yet, but it, like it's a start, right? It's something. Um, um, so we're having conversations about it right now, and I think that's where we've fallen down. Um, and I don't have a good answer about it. But uh, but otherwise, our, our approach seems to work really well. I think you actually brought up a pretty good example for us here, having all been on the agency side, of the benefit of using an agency because um, our networks are enormous, and um, we could probably you know save some time on what you're looking for by pairing that perfect person, whatever. Race, gender, yes, yeah. that is going to be, you know, the right fit for you um, instead of doing like a lot of shot in the dark stuff. So, great example of that. Because <laughs> you also have to be careful, right, with with stating any gender or like 
being any indiscriminate in any way, right? So definitely I could see that how, how an agency could help there. Um, David mentioned something really interesting um, regarding using his community to recruit. How do you guys, are you tapping into your community or player community to, to acquire talent or is that something that is really untapped at this point? I know that we do. Um, everyone has everyone's social on their phone, so you're spreading the word. You're gathering uh, people by just viral opportunities. I think EA is a big place, so we do have a lot of player network to be able to play into. Um, all of the advertisements that we do, but I think I get maybe, I don't know, 10 to 15 LinkedIn emails a day saying, I'm really interested in XYZ. You said that I could email you directly on your, your site on LinkedIn, and so then I'm introducing them directly to the hiring team within that group. It doesn't take very long just to pass it along, and so you're getting people that are passionate about your product. Within LinkedIn Recruiter, they have this awesome little thing, people that are connected to your brand, and so I can send people, hey, check this out, super mm -hmm. fast, and it's great. And so being able to hire from the community that loves EA, way easier, <laughs> you know? It makes it a lot, I, just, I think, a broader scope. Yeah, I mean, I think through the communities the, is the best approach as well. It's just, that should be the two, six, eight years of relationships that you've built. Um, and leveraging that network and those relationships is going to find you the quickest and, and, and best success especially in a market like this. Um, we were just talking about this before the panel started, is really the true opportunity, whether you're working with an agency or looking at an internal job, is finding the individual um, just prior to them switching their mental, their mental switch from um, completely passive, not looking at all, into that active phase. Um, because in a market like this, if you catch them a day or two days after that switch has been made, I mean, their, their time has already been maximized. They have three, four, five, eight interviews on the go. So. And the only way that you can catch those individuals is by having that pre-established relationship. So I think that community is huge and always working with that community. And I'm a firm believer in the relationships that you hold and the network that you have is the most powerful thing that, that your organization or you as an individual entity within that organization can, can have. So um, but it's, you know, it's a challenge like anything else. Um, we mentioned diversity, for, for example, for you being one of the biggest challenges. Um, what are, I mean, aside from the candidate-driven market, what is the main challenge that everyone is facing here when it comes to talent acquisition? Is there anything else? I mean, is it really just finding the right people or is there something else, whether it be internal, whether it be through your clients, that is the main challenge in being able to be as effective as possible in acquiring talent? I, th I think that we, we talked about the candidate-driven environment. It's having the right opportunity at the right time. You may have the right person, but if you don't have the right opportunity, you can't hire them. That's I, what I think is, is our biggest challenge is, you know, you may have someone that you've been speaking with for a long time, they're amazing, they're very, they've had top products, and you just don't have the right role. So at a big company, you can make a role for them, mm -hmm. right, and have them grow. But at smaller companies, it makes it very difficult um, because you may just, you don't have the budget, you don't have the time to be able to nurture that. So I think that that's a big challenge, is that having the right person, but just not the right position at the right time. In my, that's what I've seen. Yeah, I mean, I think for us it's, um, and I've, I've never worked internal, um, I've always been on the agency side, but we've, we've started to kind of transition our model a little bit to where we do partial or full, full RPOs, which is basically we put one of our individuals on site with a client. And I think the biggest challenge is, um, whether it's a small company or a larger company, is just organizational buy-in, right? Does this individual need to be hired? If so, let's think a little bit outside the box, right? If I'm a candidate who is, let's see, probably the most sought after skills that right now is Unity, right? If I'm a Unity candidate, I'm probably getting eight to 10 emails um, a day from recruiters. So what's gonna be something that's gonna be powerful, eye-catching? So, okay, let's work with X, XYZ Technologies, one of our you know agency clients. Um, if this is actually an internal initiative that's of highest priority, then let's make it that. So. Once a week for an hour, we go and we sit with the CTO uh, or the hiring manager, depending on the size of the organization, VP, director, whatever, and go through every single individual that we've sourced during that last five business days, and we say, okay, let's walk through these, through these together. Who do you like, who don't you like? If you like them, we're gonna sit down for this hour and we're gonna send emails from your email address or through your LinkedIn account, 
And it's so much more powerful for the CTO to reach out to John Smith or, or, or Mary Smith than Corey Myers and Von Church, right? Because we're just another agency and they're getting pounded and knocked on the door all day by us and our competitors. So just little things like that in terms of how you focus on shifting your process makes a drastic, drastic difference. So, you know, if you are an owner of a, of a small organization or in that hiring position, you know, everyone in your organization should always be recruiting. Um, they should be held to some sort of metric. Every person on the engineering team should send out three to five emails a week to their friends. Who do they know? You guys should be hosting a, a monthly happy hour and just have your developers bring all of their friends. And just planting those seeds, I mean, you never know which one will grow, but just coming strictly from the agency perspective, and I think that's quite frankly, to be honest, why we've struggled the last, you know, kind of six to 12 months is we weren't thinking outside the box. So we've, we've got to continue to reinvent the wheel. That's really, really interesting. I think my biggest challenge has been that nobody's actually made that um, teleporting thing where I can get to places faster and see more people. So if somebody wanted to invent that, that would make my life a lot easier. The fabric, the fabric of space and time is yes. Like the way that Princess Leia did it, yeah, that would, that would work. Yeah, okay. Going into science fiction here. Um, so, I mean, we're talking about the, the buy-in and everybody being in on the same page and how would you describe, I guess, how would you describe the, the best hiring managers that you work with at Scopely, at EA, with some of your clients? You know, how would you describe those people from a, from a I guess, all around perspective that makes it the most effective for you to be able to, uh, to do your job properly? Since we said Scopely first, I will go first. Um, so at Scopely, with the, the best hiring managers um, are doing exactly what Corey mentioned. They own they are hiring managers, hiring managers. Mm -hmm. And that is their responsibility. And their teams are their responsibilities. And they look at me as a resource, as a support function, as a way to maximize what they are doing. But it is their primary function. And when hiring managers pass off that responsibility of you know, an internal recruiter or an agency has to be the sole way to recruit people or find people, that's when you aren't getting the most efficient recruiting done. I agree. That's uh, where our most success has been is that one team mentality, is that if you have an open role, you are, we are a resource in recruiting. We're not going to know everybody, but we're going to try to present as many people as possible and create those relationships so you can fill that position effectively and make sure that it fits all areas of what you're looking for. That's the best way to do it. Yeah, but I think it's just adaptability on both sides. Um, every client, just like from an internal perspective, every hiring manager is a client. Um, every company that we work with, and then in turn, every hiring manager that we work with within that company is going to have a different motive, and a different process, and a different want. Um, obviously, us on the agent side, we have things that we try to call you know, client control, things that we want to put in place that we know is going to be best practices and get hires done as quickly as possible. But it's like any relationship, right? Um, one party's here, one party's here. How much can we walk to the middle? How much can we continue to, to mold this process to be best for everyone? So the best and worst relationships are, are strictly based on that. You know, How willing is everyone um, to work together and to continue to evolve in that relationship? So it's always a challenge. Hiring. You're the hiring yeah. guy. <laughs> Any, anything to say? <laughs> well, right. what, do, what do you hear from, from us as, as a panel? What do you hear that perhaps um, you're maybe you're doing a little bit differently. Are you doing anything differently, or do you feel that's in line with what makes you successful in what you're doing? One, in, like in terms in terms of what in terms of like once they're actually in the interview process, or in terms of like what 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 aspect of the hiring process are you guys most interested in in this context? Um, I guess probably bringing in the the talent too. Yeah, I mean, I like I said, with the exception of the the exception of getting in more diverse candidates. Um, I'm, I'm really quite happy with how we do things, and I, and I feel like, to some extent, precisely by broadcasting as loudly as we can what kind of company we are and what our culture is, that we, we, there's a really good match automatically with not all candidates, obviously, but many of them. Um, and I don't think it's a coincidence. Like, I mean, I'm very proud of our company culture and the, and the, the products we make and the way we make them, and, and, I, um, and so I'm happy to talk about them publicly, but 
but but um, but it, it's not really. I mean, I'm fully aware and fully taking advantage of the fact that I also think other people who might want to be employees someday might also find it attractive, right? And so there's a there's a I have a vested interest in actually getting it out there. And I, I think you see that from the companies with the best cultures. They all get it. Like at Valve, for example, <laughs> Valve leaked. I, I'm assuming it was a leak. It seemed, sure sure as heck seemed like a leak. They're uh, intentionally leaked their employee employee handbook, right? And it was full of all these wonderful stories about how great their culture is. And like that, that has to have been a hiring tactic, right? I mean, 99.9999% chance it was an intentional hiring tactic. They did it on purpose, right? If you look at Netflix, which is supposedly has wonderful, I don't know anything about them, but supposedly has a wonderful culture. Like they do the same thing. They're like, they, they proactively message the world about their hiring practices and their corporate culture and stuff like that because I think they believe that it makes them stand out and makes them look like a place that people would want to work. So, I mean, it's the same for us. At the end of the day, we try to telegraph that stuff, partially because we think we can do it in ways that are actually helpful to other studios, and partially because we think it differentiates us from other studios and will make people who are like-minded look for us. Mm -hmm. We don't, we, we, so for example, we're very clear, we're extremely clear in, in any lecture we give and in any interview that we do that we're not a studio that cares about money first. Like that's not what motivates any person who's in Sprite Fox. Like we would all like to have more money, that's wonderful, but it's like, it's so incredibly secondary. The most important thing is that we enjoy what we're, what we're doing, we enjoy how we're doing it, and we are creating products that will make the world a happier place. And that, that, that's like first and foremost. And we put that out there and we're like, if, and we make it very clear, if, if money is a really big deal for you, you should not even send us your resume. Like it's not, you aren't going to be happy here. Like we don't, you know, we're go our products never have particularly high ARP DAOs. Like, you know what I mean? Like, that's just not what we focus on. Um, we, don't, we, we don't, we're never gonna pay as well as like an EA, for example, or an Activision. Like, it's never gonna happen. Um, and that's not, like, that's just, that is how it is, right? So that sort of broadcasting, that's just one example, right? Obviously there's a lot of sort of aspects to our culture, but that sort of broadcasting I think is really important. And if you do that, y you know, things go smoother. I just have a question based on that, um, and I just wonder, you know, where you are now, um, do you think that there's going to come a time where that's, for you and your position, just not scalable? Because I think from my perspective and what I've learned in going into Scopely is uh, Scopely's best recruiter, Walter Driver, who is their CEO, and I am super flattered and humbled that he actually came to me to kind of take over that role for him, because at this point, the way that we're growing there needs to be somebody that that's my full-time job and his full-time job is to obviously run the company. So do you think that there's gonna come a time where you need to kind of have more resources like us? I don't know. I, I mean, I, I um, yeah, I really don't know. We don't need it now. Or it hasn't seemed like we had, although I think you had a good point about the diversity thing that maybe it would help there. But, but put it, so put aside that for a moment because that was a really good, really good point. Um, in, in, other, in all other regards, we've, I've been really quite happy. And the thing is that we don't have any, we have no desire to be a large company, like at all. Um, so I'm not particularly worried about scalability. Like I'm not interested in being more than 20 people anytime soon. And in fact, even 20 sounds scary to me. Like for me, I've always thought like 15 is kind of an ideal size for us at most. Um, um, but the other thing though is that a lot of the way Sprite Fox operates was inspired by um, Automatic, which for those of you who don't know is the company that makes WordPress. Um, which powers like 12% of the internet or something like that, some crazy, or 12% of the web, I should say. Um, um, and I know the founder of WordPress, we actually did some consulting for him way, way, way back in the day. Um, and they're something like, I don't know what, what size they are now, but uh, at least a, a year or two ago, they were like 200 plus people. They're totally remote, just like we are. They have people all over the world. And most of the recruiting, as far as I know, um, I hope I'm not misspeaking here because I haven't talked to them about it at all recently, um, but most of the recruiting comes from their fan base. Like they have WordPress as an open source thing and people who voluntarily contribute to the WordPress open source project tend to get hired by the company. You know, so it's a very similar thing. It's like they have a community of people who are passionate about what they do and then they sort of proactively pull from that. Um, and, and like I said, they're 200 plus people. So, you know, we're only 12. We've got a ways to go, apparently. Yeah. Um, well, I, I guess we were talking about just talking about the different things that, that you guys are doing, and you were mentioning RPO, Corey, and um, what, how do you guys feel you're different? What differentiates you from the other companies that are out there that you're doing in your talent acquisition team? And, and is that how you see the way forward, or what is the way forward, do you feel? What's the next step? 
Well, for me, having gone to, from agency, well, I was actually internal, and then I was agency, and now I'm internal again, kind of. Um, the thing that impressed me most with um, Scopely and, and Walter and Javier is um, their, their true, sincere desire to, to know who is who in the industry and have that relationship and have me manage that relationship and truly you know, understand what people have done, what they want to do next, and, and just make those connections. And I think that level of proactivity and that true uh, commitment to being a people first company is what kind of sets us apart and it makes my job easier. I think with EA, it's, it's a pretty interesting place to be because you can build your career. You can leave for a bit and go onto the uh, entrepreneurial side, and then you can come back and continue to grow your career. And that's something that I think, for me, I've worked in smaller companies, I've worked in huge companies, and I, I think EA has a place to be able to grow. And I think that's the way forward, is to offer uh, opportunities for people to grow their careers and to really work as one. I mean, we, we're a global company, we're quite large, but we work together, and it's kind of awesome. You know, I mean, you can have people in Romania working on a, a FIFA title and also in Japan, and then they're in Korea, and they're working on different products for different markets, but they're all with the FIFA brand. That's pretty impactful. Mm -hmm. So it's just, it, for, to be a part of EA, I think the way forward is you can grow your career for the long term and really, I don't know, find your place in the industry. Um, I think for us it's been kind of a hybrid uh, to, to, to your point about transparency was um, historically we have lost tons of great recruiters to companies that I just can't compete with. Um, there's multiple Von Church employees at Uber, Google, EA, and Apple, and Netflix, and for a while I was just really upset. Um, <laughs> <laughs> like well, I can't, you know, I can't compete with this. Yeah. So, um, I kind of, I think anything, anytime anything like that happens, it's it's not really about what's going on. It's about changing your perspective on it. Um, so the perspective switch after many years of being upset about this was, um, but just be transparent. Typically within the agency model, we hire a lot of individuals that are fresh out of school, and we put them through their education of recruitment. There's no degree. There's no certification program. So what we're doing right now, we're in the process of rolling out, um, hey, we'll give you your first job at Von Church. We'll give you an understanding and a lay of the land within the industry. And then we'll give you your second job, um, which is kind of through this RPO process, where what we'll do is if there's, if there's a client that's in, in hyper growth or that's just been funded and that needs an on-site resource but that doesn't have it, we'll essentially lease them that recruiter for a three or six month period. At the end of that three or six, six months period, if that individual, um, likes that organization and that organization sees them being a long-term fit, they can just take them. Um, so as opposed to, you know, being a roadblock for this issue, we basically just said, you know, can't beat them, join them. So let's figure a way to get these young, bright, you know, intelligent individuals in-house, give them the tools and the resources that they need to be successful, and then give them the next step in their career. So um, we just rolled it out. It's actually going fairly well so far. If we did this, you know, eight years ago, we probably would have monetized a lot more. But um, <laughs> so we're just rolling out. It could be a good idea, maybe not. But once again, if we're not always trying to figure out ways to diversify kind of our product offerings within the market, we're probably going to die anyway. So um, that I think is on the precipice of, of kind of one of our competitive edges. Yeah. So not not challenging what's happening. But going yeah, to the flow. Yeah, like, what am I supposed <laughs> to do? I was like, making, you know. making use of it. No, when he says, take make, them for makes a fee. total, yeah, yeah makes exactly. total sense. Yeah, yeah. If, yeah. You can for, <laughs> if you can foresee exactly. and accept exactly. it. Exactly. Exactly. Well, I want to, I, I saw the 10 minute cards. I want to just quickly, before we put it out to question and answer, talk about the candidate side. And, um, and you know, we're talking a lot about the way we're going out, you know, into the market and building our networks and, um, and being proactive. And from a candidate perspective, I think a lot of um, folks who are starting to, to become more active in the market, when they become active, what they do is they go out on the job boards and they search for jobs and, and, um, and they'll you know, apply to a position on LinkedIn or, or on a company website, or perhaps they'll even go to LinkedIn and connect with you and send you an email. But what do you see, I mean, knowing that we're talking about productivity, how do you see the candidate side changing? Where is, where is um, what is gonna be the most effective tool for a candidate to get in touch with 
say they want to work for an EA, a Scopely, or, or one of the other clients, or, or David, um, what is the most effective way? What is the way forward for a candidate? So excited about this question. Uh, so everybody in this room at some point was, will be, is a candidate, right? And I think the, the most important thing that I can say about that is that, um, that we are about the relationships. Um, you know, I, I can't speak for every company or every recruiter everywhere, but these people I've known for a while, and we are about the relationships. And so when, um, I know that you get inundated with emails and, and calls, right? But that um, there is sincerity on, on our part that we want to connect with you and understand you. And, and so the best thing that everybody can do for themselves is, you know, just to, to hear somebody out and, and have that conversation. I don't think a conversation has ever really hurt anybody. Um, makes you a little more knowledgeable. And even if it's not the right fit for you, you, you just have that much more knowledge of what's going on in the industry. I think candidate-wise, it's important to know what your goals are. Mm -hmm. um, when you're looking for a new opportunity, don't just answer every ad. Maybe talk to a recruiter that's in the industry. Understand the business that you're going into or that you're coming from and be smart about it. Be very particular at which role is interesting and why or how you can add value to the company because those, and I will answer every email that comes in because I'm just like, oh, they, they like our brand, it's so exciting. And I really want them to be there. We wanna hire passionate people that are excited about what we're doing. But knowing that you really truly are is the most important and to really understand how to, to be the best you can be within the company you're interested in. And if it's EA, awesome why why are we awesome to you and explain that and that's where you're going to find I think a really great response rate um, you know that's that's dead on I mean that's I mean I think there's a lot of industries that can't necessarily um, you know they can't necessarily expect every candidate to come in to be like I'm applying to your company because I love what you do I mean you know if, if you if, you know if you're a parking lot sweeping business or whatever you know there's there's only so much that you so much enthusiasm you can expect, but in this industry, it's it's obviously the opposite. I mean, you, you there's no reason why a, any decent games company shouldn't be able to expect that the people applying should have some interest in what they do and some prior experience with it. So for us, it's like, and, and you know, for us in particular, given that we 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 value this so much, you stick out like a sore thumb if you send a resume in and after. 10 minutes of conversation, it's very clear that you've never played one of our games. Like, you, they're free to play, for goodness sake. Like, they don't even cost anything. Like, just download it and play it. Um, and it, it, fortunately, that's actually quite rare. I mean, it, it's extremely uncommon for, for someone to, 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 but it happens all the time, nevertheless. I mean, you know, it's a small percentage, but it, there'll be people who are clearly, like, you know, I'll be talking to them and be like, okay, so which of our games do you like the most? Or, like, and they'll hem and haw and be like, oh, okay, sorry, that, maybe that's not a fair question. Like, tell me about the, the last game of ours that you played, and hem and haw, and it's like, you haven't played okay, well, you know, and then they're done, right? There's no reason for me to even think about them anymore because they, you know, forget even if I, even if they're a good fit for the company, like maybe they still would be, but like the odds are not because not only, not only have they demonstrated no interest in what we're do, we've done, but they haven't even demonstrated initiative, which is in and of itself a valuable thing, right? And we care about, and particularly since we're a remote company and people working from home, there's no manager standing over their shoulder, like they need to have initiative, right? And this is one way they can show that they, have initiative. Um, so, so, so for us, it, it, it's a. That's one of the most. I mean, anytime someone reaches out to me and they say, uh, you know, I really love X, Y, and Z game. And uh, by the way, I, I watched uh, this lecture by Daniel. Um, you know, my partner Daniel Cook, and uh, I really like to say what he had to say about this topic. And it made me, you know, really interested in you guys in general. Like huge, huge leg up for that person. You know, right off the bat, I'm like, oh, okay, well maybe they'll be a fit, because we really care. I mean, I haven't really gotten into this and I don't have time, but, but, but our culture is, very, is a very family culture. We're trying to build a section, really a second family. We know we'll never replace anyone's first family. I don't want the company to replace my first family, that's for sure. <laughs> but, but, but we're trying to make it your second family, a place that you can count on, a place that you know will take care of you and vice versa, and that you will hopefully be with for the rest of your life, potentially. Um, you know, we're only, we've only been around for six years, so you know, lofty, lofty goals, but, um, but, um, but that's what we're shooting for. Um, and so given that that's the way we feel, you can imagine, like, it really, really matters to us that you're the kind of person who cares about what we care about and who's nice. And I mean, there's a bunch of, like, check marks that, like, you have to check off. And, and, uh, and that's just, this is just essentially just the start of the process, like, you know. Um, so, yeah, so, I, I, yeah, I couldn't, I couldn't agree more. I mean, just, just, 
it's not an ego thing. It's not like I, I don't need you to flatter me. I don't care. You know, it's like I don't, you know what I mean? Like, it's not like, oh, I want to hear them say Spry Fox is great because I have a hole in my heart. It, that's not, you know what I mean? Like, it's not that. I, I just want them to love Spry Fox because hopefully that means that they'll be happy at Spry Fox. You know what I mean? I want them to be excited about our products because hopefully that means they'll enjoy making our products. You know, like, it's, it's really very simple. Um, and I, it's funny, many, many years ago, before I even, when I was first breaking into the industry, I remember resenting companies a little bit. When I would, you know, I'd read about companies making this a criteria, like, oh, you must be a fanatic, you must have loved our games. And, and I remember rolling my eyes at the time and thinking, like, well, that seems closed minded. But now that, that I'm making them, I get it. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like, I understand why those companies, and it's very common. I mean, most of the big, famous games companies, they, this is an, either a spoken or an unspoken criteria. criteria. It's like, if they don't play our games, we probably don't want to hire them. You know? It just is what it is. Um, I'll keep it very brief. Yeah. I think for us, it's <laughs> sometimes agencies can get a the reputation of being pushy. Um, I think that's why agency recruiters have a bad reputation. So we're, we're very straightforward. We say, look, the only time that we're going to push you is in the first step in the process. You never know where a conversation is going to take you, right? At the end of that call, if you don't like it, you don't mesh with the hiring manager, cool, we'll pull you from the process. But, you know, that conversation may not pay out or play, or, or play out today, but the industry is very small. And the rapport that you, that you built with that individual today could come back five years down the line when you're applying to ABC Technologies and now this individual is there. So always have a conversation. You never know what will take you. Okay, thanks. Well, um, we wanted to open it up for Q&A for the last few minutes. Um, if you guys have any questions for our, our panelists here, please feel free. <laughs> thanks for the talk. Um, I, this question would be uh, for David. So having done sort of day one hire, your very first hire all the way to where you guys are at now, um, and having seen a, a good degree of success, uh, what were your learnings in terms of like order of operations of folks you'd want to hire, and what would you do differently? That's a really good question. Um, I, so first of all, I should say that, and I, you know, obviously not necessarily every company can do this, but I, I actually started by breaking a, 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 an off-spoken rule, which, you know, people say don't hire your friends. And I, like, I actually did hire some really good friends to start off with. Um, and I, I think, I feel like that really helped. <laughs> Cause I, you know, like I, I knew them, I knew I could trust them. And again, if you're trying to build a, a company that's gonna be kind of a family, that's, that, that helps, right? So, um, so, so I started that way. I started with people who I knew and respected and trusted um, and that made a big difference. Um, and, uh, and yeah, I don't know. I mean, you know, every company is gonna have different things that they have to filter for. We, for example, learned the hard way one time um, that we needed to take very seriously the matter of whether the person could work from home effectively. Um, we, we hired someone, for example, he was actually, he, he may be very, in some ways the most technically gifted person we've ever hired. We hired a guy who told us in the interview process, he was like, I've never worked alone. I've always worked in large studios and you know, physically located with lots of other people. Um, and, uh, and I don't know. I don't know if this is gonna work for me, but I'd like to give it a shot. Um, and, I, and I was like, okay, well, thank you for being honest about that. And I asked him some questions, like, do you have friends you hang out with outside of work? The answer was no. You know, it was just things like that, right? It was like there were all these warning signs. And, and we were like, but he seems really cool and he has excellent references. So we hired him. And like, surprise, three months later, he, 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 he resigned after having done really excellent work. I mean, he, was, he ramped up incredibly fast, um, but he was, he was very clear. He was like, you guys, what you guys do is amazing. And I know I'm gonna, he, he said, I know I'm gonna regret this, but I don't think he does it all. <laughs> He's like, I have to resign. I have to go back to my old job because I'm going crazy. Um, and that was really, and I was like, oh, okay, well, gosh, that um, may, should have probably been obvious uh, in, in, <laughs> in retrospect. And so now we actually make a really big point of trying to tease out, like, does this person, you know what I mean? Like, well, I'll ask questions that normally I wouldn't have ever cared about, like, exactly like that. Like, do you have friends who you hang out outside of work? If you are feeling stare crazy, <laughs> what would you do? You know, like, you know what I mean? Like, there's just all kinds of, like, little things that you can ask that they should have answers to. Um, um, so that's an example of things, right? And there's a bunch of other stuff, like um, like when we first started off, you know, in the very, very beginning, um, we handled questions of, um, of compensation in a very traditional manner. We're just like, how much would you like? Okay, wow, that's really high. Let me see if I can negotiate you down. And, um, and, and I hated that. I hated that because it felt so counter to the concept of being a family, right? Like that's not how families work. You don't say to your, you have like three kids and one of them is gonna be a doctor and one of them is gonna be an artist. So you say to the artist, I'm sorry, son, I can't pay as much for your college. Like, you know what I mean? Like, well, maybe some families work that way. Mine certainly <laughs> does not and did not. Um, so, so, so I hated that. I hated the way the traditional compensation conversation happened in the hiring process. So we completely changed it. And now the way it works is 
we tell every single person who comes in, we're like, um, it's a direct response to kind of weirdness that resulted from those early conversations. We tell every person during the interview process, actually relatively early on now, it, it has moved earlier and earlier into the process. We say, I wanna know the minimum number that you need to be totally comfortable. And I walk them through, because you can't trust people to necessarily understand what totally comfortable means. It's like, you can pay all your bills, you can go on vacation, you can save for retirement, you don't have to worry about anything. I wanna know the minimum number that gets you to that point. And you tell me that number, and if I can afford it, I'll pay it, and there will be zero nego negotiation. Like none, zero. Um, and furthermore, this is obviously something that can evolve over time, right? Like let's say you have a kid two years from now, and so your need, financial needs go up, like that's fine. You ask me, and the exact same thing happens in real time. Um, um, and because again, trying to be a family, that's how a family would function. Not, and what does it mean? It means that some people in the company are quote unquote overcompensated by market standards. And some of them are because maybe they have a large family or whatever. And some of them are grossly undercompensated by market standards because maybe they're, you know, they're, they're married and no kids and their significant other has an excellent salary or whatever. So they just need less. Um, and, it, so we, and, and that's fine. Like no one in the company seems to mind that. Like nobody cares because everyone has exactly what they need to be totally comfortable. Um, and this, I based this in part on this emotional reaction I had to this idea of trying to build a family, but it was also based in part on fairly extensive psychological research that shows that once you have everything, all of your needs taken care of, your happiness is maxed out, essentially, from, from, from money as a source. And like, you can become more happy through other means, but money will not be that one. And, and I mean, this has come out time and time again. I mean, if you, you can talk to someone who's a billionaire, and they're not going to be necessarily be any happier than someone who's you know, making a good salary and doesn't have to worry about anything, but is otherwise not, you know, can't afford a yacht or whatever, right? Um, um, so this has worked out really, really well for us, and this is an example of something that where we've evolved over time. So we just keep looking for things like that, where it's like, is this part of our hiring process anti-family? Is this part of our pro hiring process anti-diversity? Is this part of our hiring process anti-whatever, right? Anything that we care about. And then we tweak it. Um, and we're getting pretty good, I think. Um, there's still a ways to go, but, um, but we're getting okay. Yeah. I want to get, there was another question down yeah. there. Yeah, hi panel. Thanks for uh, your insights, uh, pretty valuable. Um, as the organizational landscape in gaming is kind of uh, evolving right now, where companies are very focused on uh, cost-effective scaling and offshoring um, and sourcing re you know, remote management and matrix management, how has that kind of uh, evolved or recalibrated your expectation of long-term talent or long-term value, especially for management? As you see that like, you know, just so much is uh, being more global. Like, yeah. how has that really recalibrated things for you guys? I know for me, for my role, I've gotten to know a lot about Asia <laughs> and a lot about Europe and everything in between. And I think that it's so important. And for us, what we ended up doing is that there are opportunities within those global markets that we're making products for that market. And so you can place a senior manager or executive in that opportunity for a bit, but you still need to hire within that market to make sure you're making products that are really gonna hit a home run. It's not just localizing titles, but really creating new products for that area. So that's where I think our globalization has been successful and just kind of watching that across, you know, just the entire company, it's been a great success. And just working together to do that. So someone in Romania might head over to Korea for a little bit to be able to share their insight. And it's worked pretty well. I agree. Thank you. <laughs> I think that uh, with us, you know, um, it, it's been um, really being a partner to the operation and really um, understanding what our future holds so I can make sure that I am in the right places and um, being ahead of what's going to happen with as the market grows and shifts and evolves. And, and so I think that, you know, we do learn more about. Um, how to make that long play and that long-term plan. Thanks. Are there any other questions? Oh. Hi, uh, thanks for the talk. I'm a student at Full Sail University, so I'm an international student, and I'm studying the Game Design Master's program. So my question is, I've come across a lot of job postings, um, entry-level ones for a game designer that says a uh, minimum of three years of experience with one ship title, and <laughs> How do it says entry level. <laughs> yep, entry yeah. and and this I'm just wondering how do students get ar around that? And a lot of job postings do even say be it Europe or be it United States. Um, the postings say do they won't entertain agency applications. So what do students do to go around that? 
I mean, I think that my best advice to you would be come to things like this, right? Uh, the video game industry is very much a very close-knit industry, and it is going to be about relationships. Um, and just like anyone else coming out of college, uh, depending on what your, your focus is, um, once you get the piece of paper, it's not what you know, it's who you know. Right? So start to build relationships now. Start to talk to people now. Um, and just be very diligent about staying in touch with those individuals and continuing to grow that network. And when the time is right, um, the opportunity will pop. I mean, that's my, probably my best advice. Yeah, make sure that they know who you are. You know, and if it's not tomorrow, the, you know, the right person is always going to be the right person. And if you have a boatload of talent to bring, um, they're going to want to talk to you. And and this is, you know, for a student, it's it's a little more tenacity than maybe somebody that's more seasoned in the industry. Um, but you know, my our best advice to you is just to keep putting yourself in front of people. <laughs> Actually, that's one of the for us and for many many other studios that the, one of the one of the most obvious reasons to, to take a chance on someone who's you know trying to break in is the fact that they're like I love this so much and I'm so interested in it that while I've been trying to break in I went and I made these and it, no one's expecting it like a student project to be mind-blowing right but the fact that you tried the fact that you built something and nowadays you don't even have to just build something you can actually ship it there's no nothing stopping you from going onto iTunes and Google Play or congregate or whatever and just shipping a project and even if it sucks like just getting the experience of building it and shipping it makes you so much more valuable and you just keep doing that you know and the interesting thing is that if you do that I mean let's the, the industry is brutal right the odds are you're, you're not going to have a successful game even if you try multiple times but a you're getting useful experience and B it's not inconceivable that by you know after doing this several times with your friends that you might actually have something that gets a decent number of users and actually makes a little bit of money and you know what I mean like it, you could for all you know it could actually evolve into you doing it on your own which I mean has happened many times before but again even if that doesn't happen like there's value in that you know there's an enormous value we've never and will never hire someone who's like I have this fancy degree but I have done nothing in my spare time it's because there's so many people who have done stuff in their spare time that why would I hire you you know what I mean like there's just no point um, so that's one and then the two is I want to really agree with the whole networking thing I think just to put this in perspective and I had the benefit of a big fancy degree like I got my MBA from MIT and like which yay sounds so impressive didn't did not help at all when I graduated and by the way I networked my ass off for like two years straight I networked more effectively than almost anyone I know and still at the end of graduating I only had one offer and it was for such a low salary that I literally could not afford to take it because I wouldn't be able to pay my student loans so I had to then spend an additional year at MIT working in the media studies program um, for a really cool professor there who was doing interest, some interesting research on games um, and continued to network until I finally got offered a job that paid a salary that I could actually live off of um, and then, so finally, three years after deciding I wanted to get into this industry, got in, you know. And, and you know, again, that's with like the, the big fancy degree, right? So, so, so the networking is really important, and it can take a really long time. And there's no time like the present to start. You know what I mean? Like, uh, you know, because that is what ultimately got me in. What got me in was I met some other dude who also had an MBA, who also had a hell of a time breaking in at some point in the past, and and, and we bonded over that. And when a gig opened up at Microsoft that he thought I'd be a good fit for, which I did not know about, he emailed me. And there would no, not have been any way for me to figure it out. Like, I would never have known. If, had he not sent me an email, I'd been like, I think you should apply for this job. And I'm going to. So you keep coming to these yeah. things. Yeah. Okay. Well, and also, Thank the, the one thing that I know um, breaking in has always been the question, how, how? How do we do that? And I've been in this industry. I married into it. So if y'all are looking for, you know, <laughs> you can go through LinkedIn and start getting the date. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> no, different panel. Sorry. Yeah. Um, everyone has their way. And so the mentorship, I think, just with the vast amount of talent that's out there that wants to share with you and the networking piece, but when you find someone that you can connect with that really speaks to you about their success. I mean, people that made you know the biggest game out there, they love talking about themselves and how they got there. And so you can learn from them. So I just think it's being in the right place at the right time and that networking piece and you develop that passion. And once another game designer sees that in you, it's, uh, you should probably talk to Dave after the class because he hires yeah. his family. So no, after, I mean, it's yes. true. It's, it's really <laughs> important to just build that up and that's gonna be your direct hire, I think. I mean, we have internships I mean, most of them are technology-based, in all honesty, and it's a frustrating piece for me where 
you know, we look at full sales, and I know that we've, uh, Microsoft has established amazing internship programs, but when it comes to design and art, that's always been a, a challenge in our business, and I think it's wrong, because I think there's so many up and comers, but they go in different directions. Um, so finding mentors within this industry, I think, is your key. Great advice. I think we actually have to wrap it up, so I'm sorry. <laughs> I'm sorry, we can't take the, the question. Thank you so much to our panelists.